God has for you. That He would give His one and only Son for you. And for forgiveness of your sins. And that you might live forever. Is this extravagant love? Amen? Amen. Please be seated. Extravagant love. We're going to uh, continue our series that we have been undertaking. Since the beginning of the year, we've been going through the latter parts of Paul's letter to the Romans. We've been looking at a series that we've called, It's All About Relationships. We've been looking at uh, post-Advent, what do we do with this gift that we've been given, this amazing gift of Jesus Christ? What do we do when we receive what only He can give. Do we keep it tucked away on a shelf? Do we keep it in a box, as it were? No, we uh, certainly allow it to take root in our hearts and spring forth fruit in our lives and allow it to impact every single one of our relationships from our relationship to God Himself to our relationship to ourselves our relationships to each other, even our enemies, to the law. Today, we look at our relationship to our rights and our freedom as Christians. So if you would turn with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13. Romans 14, starting in chapter 13. I do apologize for my voice today, fighting a cold, and I may squeak a little more than usual. Nonetheless, this is God's Word. And as I say to you every Sunday, what I read to you is nothing less than the inspired Word of God. Hear what God has to say to you this day in this place, right here and right now. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word that uh, comes to us always fresh, always new, even passages that we've read many times over, yet there's still so much to learn, so much more to know about you, so many more depths to plumb that you have for us. And Lord, I pray that today you would help us plumb more of those depths, that we would be able to mine more of the riches that exist in your word. Lord, come to us with your spirit and dwell within us richly, that we would have our minds open, our ears open, and hearts attentive to what you would have for us on this day. And Father, in any place, in any instance where I make a mistake, I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to wipe those things out of our minds and memories. But Lord, make room for what's true from your word, and let those things take root in our hearts, that they would bear fruit in our lives 
I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul's been talking about uh, the different restrictions. He's been talking about, about the weak Christian and the strong Christian, so to speak. And uh, we talked about this last week in the first part of Romans 14. And he was using different ordinances of the church. Uh, he was talking about the Jewish converts who were becoming Christians and how they were sticking to the old dietary laws. They thought it was important. While the Gentile Christians, and, and even Paul himself, although he was a Jew, had understood that keeping the dietary laws were no longer important. And so we talked about how we're not to argue over disputable matters, secondary issues, because Paul calls us and God calls us to unity in the body. So let us, let us major in the majors. Let us not major on the minor things, the secondary things, the disputable matters. In his essay that's titled On the Freedom of a Christian Man, Martin Luther, the father of the Great Reformation, wrote these words. He said, A Christian man is a most free Lord of all and subject to none. A Christian man is a most dutiful servant of all Subject to all. Luther understood what the Apostle Paul was talking about here in Romans chapter 14. Our freedom as Christians is much like walking a tightrope, if you would use that analogy, please. As we, as we walk the rope, balancing the pole in our hands, at one end of the pole is our Christian liberty. And at the other end of the pole is our love for others, our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are immensely free in Christ. Our only bondage, if you will, is the bond that we have to love our fellow believers. As Christians, we're free in Christ to enjoy the creation of God in all of its facets and aspects. We exercise our freedom, but not only with a mind toward how our actions affect us, but also with a mind toward how our actions affect our brothers and sisters in Christ. The mature Christian, in a way, voluntarily limits his or her freedom. He willingly regulates his rights out of love for his weaker brothers and sisters. Let, let's see where Paul's coming from with this message in Romans 14. And see what it means for us today in the year 2013. We saw last Sunday in verses 1 to 12, Paul made that call for unity among the believers in Christ. He said, let's not waste our time, let's not waste our energy and our breath over disputable matters. Let's not be divided over differences we might have over secondary issues. Now, of course, many of the original first converts to Christianity in the time of Paul were Jews. And they carried with them 1,500 some odd years of tradition and law. Tradition and law that had been given to them directly, no less, by, than by God himself. And they, they took that very seriously. And so while these new converts embraced Christ, the Son of God, as their Lord and Savior, they hadn't been able to come to grips quite with this entirely new reality that Christ had fulfilled the law in all of its depths and dimensions completely and turned the law on its head it was just too much for them to take in all at once. Now, 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 understand, I know people who can't sleep on the opposite side of the bed on any given night without screwing up their whole day. You know, just because you've slept next to your wife on the left side of the bed for 20 years, you know, and, and, and you sleep on the right side, you know, you, you can't kick the dog with your right leg anymore. And, and, and she's just in a different position, and, I, and my rotation program is all screwed up. And, and if you do that one night, you'll, you'll be fouled up for the day. So, so, so don't, don't point a bony finger at these Jewish converts, because they were carrying a lot of tradition with them, okay? There's a, there, we we uh, have issues with a whole lot less than what they were carrying into this. 1,500 years worth. And they hot, hadn't gotten around to all the nuances and all the... Uh, implications of Christ's teaching. Even Peter, even Peter, a lifelong Jew, a close disciple of Christ, even he had trouble, even after the resurrection. 
turn to, your, to the Bible, to the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 10, because it's kind of an amazing thing when you consider that, that Peter, yes, he, he was a Jew, but now a Christian, a, a devoted follower to Christ, even after Christ is risen, he was still struggling with this idea uh, about food. It was so, so ingrained. Go to Acts chapter 10 and look at verse 9. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Peter's vision, okay? About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being led down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now here, look what Peter says. He says, surely not, Lord, surely not. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times, not once, not two, three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. In verse 17, it says, while Peter was still wondering about the meaning of the, meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found him, etc., etc. Point being, Peter himself struggled with this whole thing. And, and who, if, if Peter's going to struggle, well, certainly these, these new Jewish converts are going to struggle. I mean, he was their eyewitness uh, hearing the testimony of Jesus himself, and he still couldn't quite come to grips with this whole thing uh, about food. They hadn't quite understood the full, the full measure of the teachings of Christ. Turn with me again to another section of the Bible. Look at, look at Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Go there because I, I want you to be reminded and see exactly what Jesus had to say about things being clean and unclean. He made this very clear. Okay, it's clear to us today. Would have been clear to Peter in his time. Mark 7, starting in verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Are you such dullards? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart but into his stomach and then out of his body. In saying this, it says parenthetically, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside. And that is what makes a man unclean. Jesus is saying, Inanimate things like food and drink are morally neutral. Things have no moral qualities. And ingesting one thing or another does not impute goodness to you. Choosing one thing over another to eat or drink doesn't make you more or less moral. It's not what you choose to eat or not to eat that makes you more or less Christ-like. And so with that settled, Paul says this morning in verse 13 of Romans 14, he says, let's stop passing judgment, don't won't we, won't we? Let's stop passing judgment on one another over such disputable matters. Let's not tear each other down and be split based on such picayune things that are not primary things. He says in verse 14, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. In verse 17, he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. You are free in Christ. You have liberty in Christ. And that's one end, if you will, of the balancing pole as you're walking the rope of your freedom in Christ. You have liberty because it's not what goes in but what comes out. You're, you're free for that. However, however, Paul says, in the second part of verse 13, make up your mind, though, not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Okay? 
Verse 15, if your brother, and, and by that Paul means your Christian brother, your Christian sister, okay? If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating, he says, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. I think a more accurate translation there is not destroy, but, but rather uh, tear or, or undo or undermine, okay? Don't, don't by your eating undermine the faith that has been built up in you. Don't, don't, don't be a burden to someone who is on their path and, and being sanctified in Christ. He says in verse 20, don't undermine the work of God in someone else just for the sake of something like food or drink or I will add myself polka dancing or et cetera, et cetera. And there you have the other end of the balancing pole that we hold as we walk the tightrope of freedom in Christ. At one end you have Christian liberty. At the other end of your pole you have your responsibility to love one another. And, and that was one of our memory verses from, I think, three weeks ago, John 13. We'll celebrate this on Maundy Thursday. A new command, a new mandate I give you to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is how they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Loving each other is doing what's best for them. It's not saying that everything is okay. It's doing what's best and right. Well, I think I can understand all that. I think I can understand those two, those two ends of the pole. I think that kind of makes sense to me. I know that I'm free as a Christian to decide what to eat, what to drink, whether or not to dance, how to consider the Sabbath, etc., etc., etc. And I can do that with liberty because I know that it's what comes out of me that reveals what's in my heart. Whether or not I belong to Christ, it's what comes out of me. Now, it's not, it's not a free-for-all, it's, it's not a do whatever you want, it's not a carte blanche on everything, because we know that, that God says no, no drunkenness, no lewdness, no illicit behavior, and certainly, certainly it does, it's not a license to do anything, but I have liberty to eat and drink and enjoy what God has given me to enjoy. And I understand that as I love my brother or sister in Christ, I have to do what's in their best interest, and sometimes that means toning down my liberty. Sometimes that means, it means toning down my, my rights so that they don't stumble in their faith. Paul says, don't become a stumbling block to others with your freedom. Okay, because, because as those converted Jews understood it, they're, they're following dietary laws and, and laws of what to drink and how to, how to celebrate Sabbath. It was integral to their faith yet. Paul says, don't, don't ridicule them. Okay, you have freedom but, but don't stick your freedom in their face and under their nose and make them, in, against their conscience, go a different way. Because while that's important, those things are important, they are yet secondary matters. Your brother in Christ is in Christ. Don't, don't take them off the path. Don't derail. Don't undo the work that Christ is doing. But the question is, how far do I go with this? Do I, do, I, do I always have to voluntarily restrict my rights? I mean, I mean, what good is my freedom if I can't exercise my freedom whenever I want? It sounds like a very American question to ask. You know, what, what good is it if, I, if, if I'm free in Christ, what, then I have to restrict? Well, what, what, what's the good in that? Because if you think about it, if you fully apply Paul's teaching here, our conduct then would be governed by the narrowest thinking Christian in the church. I would be limited as a function of whoever thinks the, the most narrow here. If I take Paul's teaching all the way to its natural conclusion, I'll only be as free as the person who is most literal and most strict and most limited in their understanding of the teachings of Christ. And I don't think I like that very much. I don't like that restriction. A imagine, if you will, a Christian brother comes up to you and, and they say this, they say, you know, since the Bible doesn't record anywhere that Jesus smiled or laughed, because it doesn't record that, there's, there's no recording that Jesus ever smiled or laughed, we ought never smile or laugh. And because, it's not, because Jesus didn't do it, I'm not going to do it, and therefore, pastor, or therefore, brother, 
your laughing and your smiling offends me, and you ought not do it. Okay, that, that's an absurd, I know that, that's absurd, isn't it? Because, because you'd have to make a complete list of everything else that Jesus didn't do, and, and it would just, it would just, it would be nuts, okay? So, so let's use a little bit of common sense. Paul's not calling us to some unthinking, uncritical limitation of our freedoms. But you know, as silly as that example is, it's just the sort of thing that happens in the church. It just, it just does. When we st- stubbornly cling to secondary issues. Do you, you want to see a ruckus in the church? Try changing the color of the carpet. Let's see a ruckus. Or see what happens when the pastor stops wearing a robe. Listen for the comments you'll get for that. Okay? We, we hang on to secondary things and we, we divide. People leave over issues like that. And it is quite absurd. There's a story from the renowned pastor, theologian, Donald Gray Barnhouse. In, uh, in 1928, he was speaking at a conference near Philadelphia with about 200 young people. And one day during the conference, two older women came to see him. And they were, in, they were horrified because some of the girls weren't wearing stockings. And these two women wanted him to rebuke those girls because they weren't wearing stockings. And Barnhouse replied to these two women. He looked them straight in the eye and he said, you know, you know, the Virgin Mary never wore stockings. In fact, in Mary's time, stockings were unknown. And so far as we know, stockings were first worn by prostitutes in Italy in the 15th century when the Renaissance began. And later, a lady of nobility wore stockings at a court ball, and it was greatly to the scandal of many people. But before long, everyone in the upper classes was wearing stockings. Barnhouse said that these two ladies who wanted him to rebuke those girls were holdovers from the Victorian age. And uh, after their conversation, they had no more to say on that particular matter. He said, I didn't rebuke the girls for not wearing stockings. And a year or two after that, most girls in the United States were, were going without stockings, at least in the summertime. And nobody thought anything about it. Nor do I believe, he said, that this led toward disintegration of moral standards in the United States. Times were changing, and the step away from Victorian legalism was all for the better. The voluntary limiting of our freedom in Christ is not meant to subject others to our preferences in secondary matters that are sub-biblical. And so we exercise our common sense that God gave us as we voluntary, voluntarily limit our freedom in Christ. Here's an, an example of the way we do it in church. Um, our praise team, led by Jordan now. Um, I, we have standards of dress, okay? And... Uh, the purpose of that is, is not so that they would stand out, but in fact so that they won't stand out. So, so I've got certain, certain rules that, that we work out, and, and I don't allow certain modes of dress. And I, I'm afraid I'm looking sad. No, no blue jeans, okay? You're good today? No blue jeans, uh, no sandals, uh, no T-shirts, and certainly no flip-flops. I hate flip-flops. I hate, oh man, I hate, you want to get on my bad side? Flip around my desk. I, I, it's a... It's a it's, a, it's an issue I have. It's, a, it's my sin, okay? It's, flip-flops are like the epitome of laziness, in my opinion. It's like, it's like I, I couldn't find anything to put on my shoes. I don't care if you see my feet or smell my feet. Here they go. They're in your face. I, I, it, they were called shower shoes when I was a kid. You, you used them in the YMCA when you took a shower. You didn't, you didn't wear a dress with flip-flops, okay? They're, so you understand some of my insanity. Pray for Kim and my kids about that, okay? <laughs> point, point being, but, but here's my point. Here's why we do it. Because I, I know that if we did dress that way, and we're free to do that. We, we've got Christian liberty to dress in T-shirts and shorts and jeans and flip-flops. Yes, you do. You do. However, I know that some will see that dress, even myself, if I see flip-flops, and it will distract me. You know, I'll say, couldn't they do, you know, and, and that's, that's my sin, but, it, but it, it, hurt, it would hurt me, and I know that it would hurt some of the worship here. And so we voluntarily restrict some of our, our freedoms for the purpose of getting into the background so that we're not seen and noticed and talked about, but that God is always the center of attention. And so free to wear, yes. Restricted, though, 
We do voluntarily because, because we're jealous for God. We, we want God to receive the worship. We want, I, want, I want you to see God with your eyes and your hearts. I don't want you to, to, to comment on my blue jeans or my flip-flops. If, if you're doing that, uh, we've lost you for the day. And, and that's just not, I can't allow that. So we restrict our freedom. That's, that's just a common sense way that, that we do it. And, and that's okay. Paul helps us put all this into perspective, though. He says, he says you know, there's something at stake that's much higher than our own personal exercise of freedom. And that thing is, he says, it's the kingdom of God. I want you to see and savor the kingdom of God. Verses 16 and 17, he writes, Do not allow what you consider good, whatever that may be, eating or not eating, drinking or not drinking, flip-flops or not flip-flops, don't let that thing be spoken of as evil because it's distracting. And it's going to take their eyes off the kingdom is what it does. For the kingdom of God, the primary thing, the important thing, is not a matter of eating or not eating or drinking or not drinking or wearing flip-flops or not wearing flip-flops. The kingdom of God has got nothing to do with those things. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness. It's a matter of God's rightness, His holiness, His grace, His mercy. His will, His providence, His justice. It's a matter of of His rightness, which gives peace and joy through the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not a matter of things that are external. It's a matter of things that are holy and totally eternal. Eternal, not external. The kingdom of God is about the rightness of God, the blameless, upright, irreproachable pureness of God of God. Do you remember last year, we spent I don't know how many months walking through the Sermon on the Mount. Do you, do you remember that? Because it, it is such a vital foundational teaching to the church. Uh, it's, the, it's the ultimate, I believe, teaching beyond the cross, the teaching of Christ. It shows us what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. What it means to be a person who is, is born into, given the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Do you remember how it worked? Do you remember, remember, blessed are those who mourn, the first one. These are the internal ones. Blessed are those who mourn. Because they realize that, they're, that they can't do this salvation on their own. They, they realize how far they've fallen. And so they mourn for that. Blessed are those, uh, I'm sorry, blessed are those who were poor in spirit, the first one. They realize their, the depth of depravity. Okay? Then blessed are those who mourn. I mourn over my condition of depravity. Okay? I, I, I know that I'm at my end. I can go no further. Blessed are those who are meek then. I understand that, that my power, if I use it for my own purposes, can be a very wicked thing and a bad thing. But if I'm meek in my power, if I give it to God, he can use it for great purposes. And in fact, he does. Because on the other side of that, he says, he says blessed are, are the merciful. You understand in your depravity that you needed mercy and grace, and you received it, therefore you will give it. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. You realize how far you'd fallen. You realize the darkness and depths. And so you have in Christ the chance to become more and more like him, more pure in heart. Blessed are then also the peacemakers. Using your, your abilities and powers for God's purposes allows you to, to not fulfill your own desires, but to be a peacemaker for him. And all those things are centered around. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When our hunger and thirst is for his righteousness, for his rightness, then all these things take place. The internal change, the recognition of our need, and the moving out into the world to do his will and his work. Our hunger and thirst is not about the physical things that we would eat or drink. The thirst and hunger is for his righteousness, for his kingdom. And when you hunger and thirst for his kingdom, Paul says, then you're going to see him. You're going to see him. Kingdom living is what this is all about. It's not about rule breaking or rule keeping. It's about seeking. It's about seeking the kingdom of God. It's not about dividing over disputable matters, but about agreement on primary things. And the primary things are the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Paul says when we live for the kingdom of God, seeking his righteousness, there is peace and joy in the Spirit. If, if we're without peace, I'd suggest that we're not seeking God's rightness, but rather our own. We put stumbling blocks up then because we're not getting 
our way. For without joy, we're not seeking God's rightness, but rather our own agenda. It's not kingdom living, that's me-centered living. One of my favorite authors, Kent Hughes, says this. He says, a man who feels he must demonstrate his emancipation on every possible occasion is a slave in spite of his apparent freedom. The need to prove his liberty has become a tyranny. So whether we're weak or we're strong in our faith, whether we hold tightly to some traditions or not, we're called to live as citizens of the kingdom of God, focusing not on external things, but on the elements of that which is eternal, the righteousness of God, which gives us peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Our God is a God of unity. He makes his invitation to us all. He bids us come just as we are, polka dancer or not polka dancer. And I will give you food to eat, spiritual food. And today we celebrate that amazing and beautiful reality. In a sense of the unity of the church, Jesus Christ says, come, I bid you come and dine with me. Come to my table and know what it is to be close with me, to be in communion with me. Come all as you are to the table of the Lord. On the night that our Savior was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given up for all of you. And after supper, pouring, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. The table of the Lord set for the people of the Lord. Come and eat. This table is, is freely given. You need not be a member of this church. You need not be a Presbyterian. But I do ask that you would inspect your hearts, that you would be a, a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, that you would be of age to understand the gravity and the amazing joy in which this meal is given. But come all and partake.